and welcome to the Wilson Center, which was chartered in by Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson and is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues. And one of those issues that we're gonna to tackle today is education and games and 10 years of games being central to the federal government. My name is Elizabeth Newberry and I'm the director of the Serious Games Initiative here at the Wilson Center, which is also celebrating more or less a decade in uh, existence. And one of the things that we do here at the Wilson Center is we bring games together with key policy discourse and try to amplify those who are using games for positive outcomes across the federal government. One of the hats I wear is the chair of the Federal Games Guild, which is an informal community of practice of federal agencies who are interested in the use and the correlation of games for federal initiatives. As we're gonna learn today, FGG, as we call it, came out of efforts in the White House, OSTP, to bring together those interested in using games to meet agency goals and engage the American people. The FGG is now housed at the Wilson Center Serious Games Initiative as part of our founding objectives to set by Congress to be a forum for nonpartisan dialogue and collaboration. In FGG, we have nearly about 100 members or so that span across the federal entities uh, across DC and beyond from the Department of Education who is here with the Ed Games Expo uh, to NASA, to the Smithsonian, to the State Department and everybody across the government. Not everyone in FGG is fortunate like me to have games in their title, but all of us have a genuine interest in game-based approaches. There's a common ethos amongst us for leveraging games for positive outcomes, focusing not on designing games for entertainment, but for pro-social reasons, whether that's education or research or any sorts of uh, number of issues, just as long as it's something that's positive and impactful. The way we do it varies dramatically by member of the FGG, but there are generally three primary actions that we take. One is a lot of our members fund and support game-based approaches. Another is a fair number of us research game-based approaches. And another hat that we often wear is we also make games. Some of the games that have come out of the funding side of uh, members of the FGG, like Department of Education, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Institutes of Health, are games like Folded, which is a game about folding proteins and helping support research. Walden, a game which we'll learn a little bit more about at this uh, particular program. Happy Adams, again, one of the, the games we're gonna hear a little bit more about. And virtually all of the games were featured as across the Ed Games Expo. Some of the games that have been developed by members of FGG, so that means that we've actually done that sort of in-house, are games like The Fiscal Ship, produced by the Wilson Center, which is about the uh, federal budget and navigating the national debt. And then a couple of games from the Smithsonian, uh, Tammy's Tower, which is your play is like a little monkey, um, a little tamarind specifically, and get to stack uh, blocks, uh, learn about physics. Um, also the Smithsonian's Learning Lab has produced uh, several uh, game-based approaches such as Journey Through an Exploded Star, which you actually get to go through and learn about uh, space. And then uh, most recently also Harmony Square from the Department of State. You can learn a little bit more about some of these games and some of these initiatives on our website which is at wilsoncenter.org backslash federal dash games dash guild. Um, and some of the other things that you can find on our website there are, uh, for example, if you're a game developer, we have a PDF up there of federal grants and opportunities to connect with people in the government. If you are a member of the federal government and interested in how games can level up your mission goals, please do reach out to me directly. I'd be more than excited to uh, connect you with the broader FGG. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic over to my colleague, uh, Ed Metz. He's gonna tell us a little bit more about the Ed Games Expo. Ed? Hello, I'm Ed Metz from the Institute of Education Sciences in the US Department of Education. Since 2013, I've led the Ed Games Expo, an annual showcase of game-changing innovations in education technology. 
During this year's expo, more than 120 teams of developers supported by more than 40 government programs are participating. While we'll miss being together at the Kennedy Center again this year for the expo, a silver lining of hosting a virtual event is the opportunity to engage a national audience to demo games and tech and share resources to prepare for a new era in education going forward. Thanks for joining today's event, where we're going to hear from four of the leading experts in the field of learning games. The first session features a conversation with Constance Steinkuhler and Mark Delora, each who served a term in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. Simply stated, without the time that Constance and Mark spent in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, we would not be here today for this event. Constance launched the Federal Games Guild in 2011 to build capacity for learning games by bringing together representatives from across government, and by doing so, put learning games on the map in Washington, D.C. Mark Delora followed Constance at OSTP in 2013. Mark led the Federal Games Guild as well, hosted a game jam inside the White House, and played an instrumental role in supporting me in getting the Ed Games Expo off the ground in 2013 and sustaining it in the years since. We're excited to hear from Constance and Mark about the emergence of education learning games the past decade and to hear what needs to happen next to deliver on the promise of technology to support student learning and career readiness. Off to Tammy Schrader in Washington State to lead a conversation with Constance and Mark. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Tammy Schrader, and I was asked why I became involved with games. And why I became involved with games is because I taught middle schoolers, and they drugged me kicking and screaming into this gameplay place. Um, I had a young man do an assignment for me once, and his answer to my assignment was that he hacked into Mario and and I had never played Mario. I knew who Mario was. <laughs> Mario and I are still not great friends. But um, <laughs> what I noticed when he did that was how excited and um, engaged all the kids were. They would come in on their own time and just do all of this thing where they wanted to play a game about cells, but because it was through Mario play. Um, and, you know, at some point when you're teaching kids, you're hired to serve them. And that's how I got involved in games. What I did not know was that games was a thing. I, di I didn't know that gameplay in schools or education was a thing, uh, but I quickly learned that it was. So uh, here with us today, I'm so excited to announce uh, Constance and Mark, and they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, Constance, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, my name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Constance Steinkuhler. Um, I have two boys in middle school. One is about to graduate eighth grade. I'm a researcher and professor at the University of California, Irvine, and I've been studying games for impact in kids and what kids do around both commercial and educational games for about 15 years. Awesome. Thanks, Constance. And Mark, if you'd like to unmute and talk to us and introduce yourself. Sure, Tammy. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mark Delora. So I'm a software engineer by training. I worked in the game industry for about 25 years at Sony and Nintendo and Google and Ubisoft and a few others. Uh, had the honor of working in the Obama administration in 2013-2014, where I mostly focused on games for learning and also K-12 computer science education. And since then have been back here in Seattle, which is where I am now, uh, doing consulting and contracting work, again, kind of both in those spaces of computer science education and in games for learning. Okay, so here are some questions that I'm really excited to ask because I know how I um, ended up in the gaming world. My question is what sparked you, I mean, you guys kind of started this movement, how exciting, and what, what sparked your interest in using games for the greater good or, you know, to solve the world's problems or in educate or whatever, you know, what started that? Well, I mean, I would say there's two layers to starting it. So my, um, my good trouble started over in looking at video games. I was not at all a gamer, um, but I was a researcher looking at interaction online and problem solving. And I was very interested in what people might do with the internet. This was right, I was in graduate school right around when 
the internet was crossing like a 50% mark. So um, it was becoming more normal to be online um, in everyday households. So I was really intrigued by that. And we were doing a lot of lab studies, like doing some really interesting um, studies of people problem solving together in these chat room spaces. But I started getting frustrated with my work because all of the activities I would design, um, even though we could find like, um, you know, differences between conditions, it was clear when you looked at the transcripts that people were not very engaged. And it's really hard to you know, it's really hard to study what people can do with technology when they don't, when they're not invested. It's, you know, I always say it's a lot like hiring the tabernacle choir to hum, you know, you need people to feel invested in the work. So one of my uh, main professors, a man named James Paul G, um, you know, I was frustrated with what I was doing. And he said, you know, you ought to be looking at video games. And I was like, video games? Come on, you know, I was like a, a kill your TV person, super book snob. And I was like, game names. He's like, no, you need to go and take a look because what people are doing there is some of the more complex work that you'll ever see happening online. So I went, I downloaded at that time what was the globally dominant title on the market and I never turned back. Um, you know, so then, so that was sort of stage one. I did a bunch of research around kids and games and it turns out of course that this isn't surprising for gamers, but for non-gaming public, it is surprising that games really recruit all of this incredible cognitive work. They recruit identities um, and community. And, you know, we've seen how those can be really amplified for good and for democracy, or they can end up being amplified in ways that are not quite so, so pro-social or pro-democratic. So um, I entered the Obama um, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to work on how might games be a way to forward the administration's agenda under Obama. Um, and the federal game school came about because it turned out that, that, you know, the first thing I did was go look, okay, well, who's doing work on games? What, what agencies are funding game-based projects? And I started just literally putting on my sneakers and walking around to agencies in DC. And what I saw was going on, although people may not call it games all the time, agencies were already doing um, incredible work with interactive media and they were doing it in a total vacuum. They were oftentimes having to, um, you know, think about funding and selecting and organizing projects that are about these sort of media that are hard to produce. Um, and that's where a lot of the Federal Game Guild came about was trying to share that information because you had isolated individuals that were really learning you know, really um, developing skills. And so rather than everyone developing in an isolated way, the idea was to put everyone together and knowledge share. Mark, do you wanna share your thoughts on that? Yeah, so for me, I think I came at games by way of virtual reality. So the virtual reality bump that was late eighties, late or early nineties, I got, I got lucky it just happened to be at a, at a university where a lab has sprung up, an early lab for VR. I got involved with that as an undergraduate. and. For me, the experience of, of going into a world somebody had created and, and experiencing it as if it was a real place, it was very, it was so impactful. Even if the, the graphics were cartoony and the audio was terrible, it was so reactive that I thought, you know, there's, there's something here, there's some way to use this technology to impact people, to tell stories, to teach, to, that there's something, how do we do this? Of course, then VR kind of came apart <laughs> back then. Uh, it was like, hmm, okay, what do I do now? Uh, and I had trained myself up in 3D graphics. And at that time, the game industry was coming up into 3D graphics. So it was perfect. So I transitioned, I worked at Nintendo for quite a while. I worked at Sony for quite a while. Um, trying to teach developers how to utilize uh, games to tell their stories and to do it using 3D. Um, so I, I did that for quite a while. And, and for me, I think the, the, the puzzle was always, I'm telling these amazing stories. I've got this really elaborate technology that I've built, but the messages that we're conveying are limited to a very narrow band. It just seemed like, how do we, how do we blow this up? How do we get more opportunity to tell more stories, to impact people in more ways? How do we do that? And so when I wound up in the Obama administration, my message really talking with folks in government was games are a super popular form of media. They're basically learning machines. I mean, if you look at the first level of Mario, it's like, here, let me teach you how to jump. Here, let me teach you how to jump over this. Here, oh, okay, here's Bowser. Pass this or you haven't learned how to jump, <laughs> you know? Um, 
it's like this this form of media you just don't know how to use it quite right yet so let's figure it out let's all explore together let's use all the information that's out there all the amazing people who've been making games for years and years and years let's leverage that and find a new way to tell stories through games awesome so beyond founding the federal games guild what were um some of the early game projects that you were involved in and what did you learn from that so inside i mean working from inside the the um, administration one of the an example i guess project there were a lot of really terrific ones um and i think we're going to see those in the expo as well but those continue those products still continue um one of the efforts i found really exciting was the glass lab effort and that sort of came together while i was doing my um the period i spent in the in ostp um, and that was really exciting because I feel like, um, especially at that time, building some collaborations between industry, researchers, and agencies was really, really um, provocative and helpful. So if you think about an agency's trying to solve this national problem or question that we have, trying to forward whether it's uh, national health or engagement in voting or, you know, getting young people into our public shared space, right, our, our national parks. So the agencies work on solving these national problems. So they know what kind of problem is worth going after. They think really hard about that. And they know a lot about the problem. Then you add in, um, you know, game expertise, designers, Game design is a really hard practice and it's still to this day, oftentimes more apprenticeship based than say um, college program based in some ways. And so you'd have these like game scholars, these you know game developers who had really deep knowledge of how to build systems that were provocative, thoughtful, well-played, well-playable um, and could elicit interest in those national problems. So you combine that expertise with researchers on things like how to change behavior or how to like um, improve understanding. And you end up with this great group of talent I found that could really marshal some really, um, I guess some projects that would change the needle. So the Glass Lab to me was a really great example because it was this wonderful collaboration between um, foundations that would support, uh, it was the Gates Foundation and I believe MacArthur as well. You had, um, you know, ESA, the Entertainment Software Association giving talent and part of their campus in California to, um, to, support this effort. And then you had, so they were making games out of commercial IP, but then you also had them seriously take teachers seriously, as in trying to understand how do you get interactive media like games into the real classrooms, into K through 12 classrooms. And the way that you do that is you actually listen to teachers who will tell you when they're helpful, how they're helpful, what they need, what time scale, and what kind of assessment they need out of it. Um, so that was in many ways for me, a really exciting example program. And I think there are so many now like that, where you have people coming out of their silos to do um, work that are at the intersection of multiple disciplines that, you know, you might think that they're really different, but in fact, I found that, you know, researchers and federal agents, uh, you know, you get them with game dev people and, um, forgive me for saying so, but they're just like one degree of nerdiness away from each other. Like they're, they all kind of like systems. They all kind of like the same class of problems. So there is this role there, there. And so putting some of those teams together, I thought was um, one of the big lasting benefits of some of the work that the Federal Games Guild did, because that's the talent pool. Yeah, I, every time you say the word glass lab, it just makes me feel a little sad inside. <laughs> it's it was such an amazing project. I, I was I worked at Glass Lab before I came in uh, to the government. Uh, I helped spin up Glass Lab as a CTO on contract because, like, I'm I think prior to um, work in this space, I was probably known more as somebody who tries to find ways to get uh, game technology to be more accessible to people. So I, I did a series of books and I work as developer relations kind of person and and, um, and then uh, my transition was kind of from from working at Ubisoft where Ubisoft was trying to do really interesting creative things with their titles and with their stories um, to coming on to help out Glass Lab 
that was the, the epiphany for me. Like if, if, if we can build technology that makes it easier for Glass Lab and the companies they're working with to build more tools for teachers, why wouldn't we do that? If it's all the same technology, just a slightly different twist on it, and you know, and we don't know how to do it. Like, let's do it. <laughs> why, why are we not doing more of this? Um, so it was for me wonderful to come into the government, and um, I adopted the Federal Games Guild that Constance had started up, and um, tried to find ways to to bridge to the external community. Tried to find ways to to find more people inside of the agencies who maybe didn't want to say the word game out loud because they were worried about the ramifications of that, and just get them all in the room together and say, you know. We love you all equally. Like, let's go create something awesome. <laughs> so I had a hands in, in lots of games over the years, but not a lot of games for learning stuff until my time uh, helping uh, Glass Lab spin up. Okay. You know, what I what I love about what you, you two are saying is you're talking about being connective tissue between um, the, the game-based community, game developers, and like education or healthcare or whatever organization. And I, what I love is that we're saying it in a sentence and, and when Constance like, yeah, you just put people together. And I'm like, uh, you know, I serve 59 school districts and trying to get game-based education in the 21st century into the 59 school districts is a bit of a lift because of the reputation that games have. And in fact, at one point I will quote a counselor, you can't be learning if you're having fun, right? Um, so I know that that's one of the barriers I face. So my question to you is, what are some of the barriers that that you see in this work and that you've had to overcome? Well, I definitely think that you're right. That word games is really triggering for people. Um, and I think part of it is well-founded. You know, the games industry um, has always had a bit of like a, um, a rogue kind of um, reputation and that's part of its draw. There's always been this sort of presumption in the games industry that if you add the word educational to it, it will kill the title. So just don't add the word education. It turns out like some of the top titles, especially in the indie market are all what I would consider games for impact. So, <laughs> so just remove the title and that's just fine, right? Um, but yeah, the word games really triggers people. And I mean, and we've seen it, we've seen backlash as well. I mean, uh, you know, so people use words like interactive media to sort of tamp down those concerns. And the reason that they're concerned is because the industry does not always have a very good reputation with, um, parents with um, older adults, especially those who do not game, right? It is always, you know, some of the titles that you see and hear about most frequently are also some of the titles that are intended for adults. They're not intended for children. So they're adult content with mature themes, you know, that kids may be playing without parental, without their parents necessarily knowing or sometimes family approve it. But because of that, you know, games sort of very early, um, sort of suffered and still continues to suffer kind of a bad a, a bad reputation in certain ways. So as I said, that bad reputation also gets them, you know, um, it's not all bad for them financially because they trade on that sort of transgressive play kind of um, reputation that they have. But games are so varied. It's like talking about television, right? Um, uh, you know, to talk about the impact of TV on learning is hard to do without dialing in on, well, what kind of TV, what kind of content, for what age group, for what kind of context of use, are they doing it with peers, are they doing it with the parents on the couch, you know, what's the scenario? And I do think, honestly, that in my, in my life career, in my lifespan, I'm getting older now, and you know, I, it used to be in like the, you know, in the very early 2000s, I had to, if I did a 30 minute talk, I had to spend 15 minutes trying to convince people that I wasn't out to expose children to uh, dangerous content or inculcate people with, um, with hateful notions or, you know, I mean, there was really a lot of work to put down on that. And now I think because, you know, the Nintendo generation has, has, is now parents, but I think that some of those innate fears around games are tamped down because the general literacy around games is much higher now. You know, now the moment I talk about like games for learning, I have audiences say, well, game, what games? And I'm like, thank you. You asked me which games, right? Because some games, it's just like books. Some games are art and some games aren't. Um, some games are, are intended to be, you know, educational. Some aren't. Um, 
So I think there's a lot of variety and I think that that a lot of those attitudes have changed, but that has definitely been probably one of the biggest hurdles to get through. And I would say now, you know, I think that um, the American cons consumer base for games, including schools, I see far more movement of games in classrooms now, far more normalizing of the idea of educational games in both AAA and the indie scene where educational games are no longer seen as just dead in the water, not for profit. Um, I would say now one of the biggest hurdles uh, in my estimation is that, um, you know, the kind of game communities that game companies AAA are spawning are not always uh, healthy places for people to be in. They're, they're renowned for toxicity and extremism. And so game companies are organizing around the Fair Play Alliance and making other efforts to figure out how to tackle this. But until there's something that's that makes substantial progress. I think that consumers right now are again chilled off the market a bit, thinking, you know, um, maybe the game product may not be bad inherently, but some of the behaviors that are being allowed to have happen in those spaces uh, are. So I think that's the new challenge for games. Yeah, I used to. Um, I like what you just said, Constance. It reminded me of of when I was in a White House, and I would. I always joke that anybody who came in the door who had gray hair, now I have gray hair, so I can say this. Um, I was going to have to spend another 15 <laughs> or 20 minutes trying to convince them that games were something they were, <laughs> they were okay. You know, I, uh, the title that I had didn't, it didn't have the word games in it. We used digital media. That was deliberate because, you know, we didn't want people to be immediately reactive. But then I almost always went immediately into games. You know, I had, I had this Pikachu on my desk. I had a bookshelf made out of Legos. I was really like, <laughs> trying to put people at ease and say, look, <laughs> this is about learning and it's fun and it's okay. Uh, but there, there was a big barrier. I think I think now the barrier that that I bump into, and I feel like this is the same barrier we've run into since the you know, mid nineties, early nineties in the edutainment bump is um, you might wanna make a great game for learning and awesome or a game for impact. And okay, so you're gonna make one. How are you gonna make the second one? Because it's really difficult to sell these if you're trying to make them for K-12. Trying to sell into the formal school system is super difficult. If you're trying to sell them as an informal learning product, now you're on Steam or the App Store and you're competing against this huge amount of content that's there. And so you have to have a bunch of money to put into marketing. I think as a game studio, if you're not able to make a game, learn from it, make a better game, learn from it, make a better game, we're not going to advance the field of games for learning very quickly because people do run. It'll be their passion project. They'll have their spirit crushed and they'll be like, I'm out. I'm going to go make a first, <laughs> you know, where I can support my family, sadly. <laughs> so this is still the, this problem. We've had it. You know, the industry came apart in the mid 90s, the edutainment industry, um, because of issues related to this. And I think it's still a challenge today. Yeah, so here's, I, I've been told we're at the five minute mark. So here's the last question I have. Well, I have, have two more, but so I'm gonna sneak the last one in, but the, this is the one. What is What do you think the future of games is in like in the government? I hope it's big and continued. Um, I think it's been going on. I mean, since the the report that came out about five years ago that really, um, um, with all due respect for political points, took pot shots at efforts in agencies that were trying to engage the youth generation in pro-social, pro-democratic, national kind of efforts that were really important problems to solve. I think that report was not in good faith. And I think that um, one of the biggest challenges is this very issue of sort of getting people over their preconceptions about what games are, et cetera. Yeah, I think events like the Ed Games Expo are, are the perfect thing for government right now because it's you can see this long history of investment into the field and you can see the impact that it's having. And to have a big showcase like this where agencies can come in and see what other agencies have done, um, it, it's super impactful. Um, for me, seeing the Federal Games Guild continue to go on, you know, when I left uh, in 2014, Eric Martin came in uh, to OSTP and he was he picked up the games portfolio for a while. Uh, and now Federal Games Guild keeps going and going and going. It's, you know, I love it. I, the fact that Harmony Square came out recently and is just brilliant. It's a short game. It's punchy. You know, you're going to get out. You're going to learn something. It's, 
I, I have really great feelings about the future of games in government. That's you know, um, oh, sorry. No, Constance, please. You. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, I think what one thing I really love about the Federal Games Guild and the expertise it represents is that, you know, games are not the right treatment for every goal. Sometimes a pamphlet is a much more effective treatment, right? Games are expensive. They take a lot of thought to produce and produce well. But when it comes to thinking about complex systems and feedback among components and having a goal of where you want that system to go, there is almost no medium that can do what games can do in terms of turning a complex system into something that is manageable, understandable, and playable. And I think what it provides you are these first person experiences that can be really transformative. So having a first person experience from the inside of a cell, if you're, you know, if you play as, for example, a virus trying to invade the human body, trust me, you'll learn that human body's defenses very, very well. And there are these sort of more complicated ideas because now we have problems that are system level problems. And some of those problems really um, are very hard to understand from a first person narrative. You need to think about them as an interactive system. And that's where games I feel right now are probably the only medium that really, games and simulations that really enable us to understand that, especially to help uh, public understand it. Um, so that you don't need a PhD to understand what's happening in, say, global climate change or energy conservation. So I think that is probably the lasting promise and why games are here to stay. Yeah, I always look back at the work that Dave, Dave Rajewski, so the first, the first game in government that I was aware of was uh, Budget Hero uh, from yeah. David Rajewski at the Wilson Center. And you're talking about, Constance, you're talking about kind of describing a complex problem and being able to experience it and learn about it from the inside. I mean, this was about the federal budget, right? The idea was you were trying to build a budget that was a balanced budget and also reflected your particular priorities. So you would play these cards that represented policies and then it would say, okay, 30 years out, this is what happened. And it was such a grounded experience for me to be able to get in there and just fiddle and like, oh, that totally didn't work. Okay, let me try this. That, oh, well, that's a little better. Let me try this. And, and I know that they they mined some of the information that they learned about it uh, and would present some of that information on the policies that were uh, interesting to the players. They would present to Congress as sort of a, hey, FYI, people might be interested in this sugar tax or, or something like this. And I know in, in more recently, there's been the game, The Fiscal Ship, which is kind of like a Budget Hero 2.0 that came out, really similar philosophy. I definitely recommend that game too. Yeah, you know, one of the things in classrooms that I loved about games was that students could go in, you know, to talk about climate science, right? Students can go in and they can muck around with the planet without actually destroying ours, right? And and they're, they're just a hands-on. And I, and I love what you guys said about understanding the system. So first of all, I want to thank you both, um, not only for coming today, but for impacting me because I had no idea that there was a whole Games Guild out there until um, the Obama White House through the Game Jam. And I, and I know that's, Mark, that's where I met you. And um, in fact, when they called me and said, do you want to come back to, you know, be at the Game Jam at the White House? I said, is that like a house that's white in DC? Or they're like, no, no, it's the White House. I'm thinking, why is our, pr I mean, like I had no idea. And it was, I can assure you, life altering for me. But here's my very, very last question, right? Um, and that is, what is a classic learning game that you believe stands the test of time? Or, or a classic game that stands the test of time? Uh, Constance, I can't, I just, okay, I can't hear you. I have so many games um, that I'm interested in. Right now, everyone should play Plague Inc., which is like, I think one of the very top iPad games, Pandemic, Plague the board Inc. game. Plague Inc. You have to okay. try to basically infect the globe. Talk about learning a lot about viral vectors. Plague Inc. for iPad. Pandemic okay. Legacy is one of the best board games I've ever played. Okay. And right now I'm learning Spanish on Duolingo. And I cannot believe I'm going to say this because I've never been big on gamification. But their gamification system totally works. And I am in full competition mode with both my husband and my eighth grade son. So I'm not winning. <laughs> but I'm trying. <laughs> okay, Duolingo. 
Okay, thanks, Constance. That's um, you know, I love all the enthusiasm for games. Mark, your your turn. <laughs> yeah, that's funny because I was playing Duolingo too <laughs> until recently. I actually what got kind of worn wait, out. What on language it. are you learning? Uh, uh, Japanese. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think it's really clever the way that they've they've built the incentivization structures into into Duolingo, but um. You know, I, I think when I think of like, what's the learning game, the canonical learning game, of course, is Oregon Trail. Um, but what I always think of is just the, is always the first level of Mario. Like that's the, the learning game for me, because it's a game where you learn something and then you prove that you learn something. Um, now, I think like the game that I'm probably most interested in that I've, I've been playing is a game called Alba. And you play a little child on an island and you are cleaning up the island and you're hanging out with your friends and you're just running around the island there's like birds everywhere you take pictures of things and learn about what the birds are or you know talk to the other characters on the island about alba alba it's great yeah it's, it's super good so okay. and i'm very excited about the the future of these kinds of games yeah okay you guys thank you so much for letting me uh spend 20 minutes with you it was so fun um you guys are so wise and two of my biggest heroes so i just want to uh, thank you for letting me moderate and thanks for being here. And thanks I think for having us. Good afternoon. I just want to tell you how excited I am to be here. So here is your first question. You guys ready for your first question? Yes. I, I feel like we're playing baseball and I'm just going to lob it to you and here we go. So this conversation is going to take us back to 10 years ago when game-based education was kind of the new frontier. So tell me, um, what did game-based learning look like 10 years ago for you guys? Oh, what a good question. You got any thoughts on that, Tracy? Well, sure. I, you know, 10 years is a funny mark because, um, well, first of all, I just want to say that, you know, when I was growing up, we had game-based learning. So um, I'm a lot older than that. I won't tell you how old, but uh, uh, so I think, you know, game-based learning has been uh, around for quite a long time. Um, it, it got a kind of a bad reputation for a, a long time, I think, um, because not a lot of great game designers, I mean, there were some standout products, there's no question about that, but not a lot of really great game designers and uh, perhaps great stakeholders had, had joined the conversation about how to really optimize um, and make games that were playful and fun and interesting and uh, effective in terms of learning goals. So it was really, for me, in my mind, uh, we formed the Game Innovation Lab 17 years ago. So in my mind, that those early times start a little more than 10 years ago, I just would say. Um, and I remember seeing, you know, articles come out going, wow, you can't do this with games, which was crazy, of course. There was this sort of sense that you couldn't take on difficult topics, um, that somehow um, uh, games, sh you know, shouldn't go in that area. And like I said, they had a little, learning games had a little bit of a stink around them, right? Uh, because they'd been made a little bit um, to be kind of just textbooks with a little chocolate on them, right? Um, and for me, it was more like 17, 15 years ago when people with real creative interest in expanding the field started getting involved and you start seeing, um, you know, actually folks at Carnegie Mellon and folks at, at USC, I think two of the really big standouts were things like Darfur is Dying um, and then Aki's Game, which I'm going to have a, I'm going to blank on um, uh, right now, but perhaps Jesse can fill me in, uh, having a senior moment, uh, came out and people sort of really rethink about how complex these games can be, how interesting these games could be, right? How they didn't just need to be uh, like sort of trivia or or shooting mapped onto uh, to content, right? So that's, uh, to me, it's when you, you get energized by feel the creative people and also um, greater funding opportunities, greater distribution opportunities. I do think some of the big changes we've seen in the last 10 years are the, the nature of platforms. That, that continues to be something that evolves a lot because we went from a time when getting software into schools was really challenging because schools were still thinking about, our, should we be online? Is this something that we should support? Um, and we, at, at the time, uh, there was still a huge focus on Flash as a way to uh, deliver games because it was so ubiquitous. Uh, but then Apple killed Flash, but then Apple's like, that's cool, we're killing Flash, but we're bringing in 
iPads, and that's going to revolutionize education. And uh, no, no, nope, that's not it either. And so the the things that we thought were going to be the future, you know, Flash and iPads, we thought that was going to be wow, that's where game based education is going to go. Now we're seeing that isn't what it is. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, HTML5 as being really important as a platform, as well as finding, you know, we now have better ways to do downloads, but still the world of schools does, there's schools are still not great at downloading games. So we still have platform issues, but they've changed a lot. Oh, that is so true. That is so 100% true. I mean, bandwidth, just just basic bandwidth to schools and the, yeah. the fact that they tend to have lower end technologies available because, you know, they have to buy a lot of these computers. And so they buy, you know, not the top end. Right. Uh, uh, Chromebooks uh, are really dominating in the school absolutely. space now, which is, I, I think, something that we hadn't seen coming. And so, I mean, this this matters just because the world of normal, the normal world of game development is living in a very different place than the platforms that are normal for education. And so that's, that's I think, one of the biggest, most unexpected things that everyone's still trying to, to figure out. And uh, so we're, that's, that, that continues to evolve. Yeah. Agreed. And, and one of the things I think I'm loving seeing, and not that I would have wished COVID on anybody, but I, I often think if you had given me a year to plan for COVID, I could not have rolled out the things that rolled out almost overnight. Like in my community, we had police officers and, and the fire department delivering technology to kids because now it was, it was needed and it was needed urgently. Um, so in that way, I'm hopeful that games have become a stronger platform for schools because of the tech that they are required to have now for anything. Um, so looking into your crystal ball and the future, what sort of impact do you think we can expect from games on student learning? Hmm, well, let's see. Look at the crystal ball here. <laughs> Jesse's um, crystal ball. Uh, now yeah, that's I, awesome, Jesse. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I, I would my, say, my crystal ball is smaller, Oh, it's pretty Jesse. good. Um, but, uh, pretty good. <laughs> I, okay, I just have to say this. Gamers have the best toys. I don't care, whatever you say, you guys have the best toys. Um, yeah, I think we're going to continue to see different ways that games get integrated into curriculum. Now that it's getting more normal for, uh, for students to be online, I think, I think, I feel like some of the biggest ways we're going to see are, uh, games that make for good homework. I think, we're, uh, I think there are more and more instructors that are finding like, Hey, these are, because games are really good for homework. That's what they're they're really best at. Because homework is the time that you have time to you can do. You, you're going to take ten minutes to do it or a half hour to do it. It's kind of like up to you and how fast you're going, as opposed to anything that work that has a game that has to fit in the classroom. And games can be used to so that you can kind of explore things on your own, get familiar on your own. Um, and so I I think I feel like that's some of the, the areas where we're gonna see uh, the most growth and the most opportunity because it's now becoming more normal for people to be doing their work, not with pencil and paper, but to be doing their work digitally. And so it's going to start to fit in more naturally to uh, traditional educational process. I, I think that's a really interesting perspective on that. And, uh, and I would agree that it's a great opportunity for games. Some of the things that I saw Tam, your point about, you know, COVID being this sort of energizer in this area is fantastic. And some of the things that I've seen just in the past year with our own work is um, a real uptick in teachers wanting this material, especially teachers in areas like, for example, humanities, uh, where I do a lot of work, um, you know, this people who maybe were a little bit like, I don't know about games, you know, uh, came in droves, right? Um, searching us out, looking for best practices, really interested in um, becoming part of, of um, you know, this game-based learning ecosystem, right? And what's so fascinating to me about that is that, you know, these are non-traditional fields where games could be used. And like, for example, you know, people are using uh, Walden in literature classrooms and history classrooms in 
um, uh, environmental science classrooms, um, et cetera, it's not a typical place where you'd find um, a game being used, right? Especially like in a literature classroom. Uh, and I think there's something really important about the new people coming to, you know, willingly and, and, ex and with a lot of excitement and energy into, into the field. And I'm always more interested in people than technologies myself. All these platforms, like we wrestle with the Chromebooks, we're wrestling with all the technologies. It's, that's the problem part of our jobs is to mm -hmm. figure out how to get it there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And how to support it, how to, you know, do diagnosis on why you can't get it and help you and hold your hand. Um, the, the really important part though, is the people and building that, that foundation of a desire to work with uh, these materials and a, um, you know, f sort of foundational knowledge that can be passed on and sort of spread throughout an institution where people then trust and, and, do, and want to do creative things with it, right? I don't want to just park my kids in front of it. I want to figure out, oh, wait a minute this is a whole new way of exploring the ideas here, the learning goals here. And that's, that's exciting to me. And that's what I feel like we're on the cusp of, especially with COVID sort of giving us that, that push, right? Absolutely. And so you, you have both made award-winning games, right? Um, that have been used in classrooms. So as a teacher and as a person who gives professional development to teachers, um, what are some ways that you build in, how do I know what students have learned from your game? What, what, what kind of student impact are you having? And how do you, how do you look at that? Yeah, I, I know we find it different for different experiences. Um, uh, there are times when we don't think about that at all. We just think about, let's just make sure that this gives the students a way to interact with the material that's interesting as opposed to providing, here's a checklist that we crammed all the facts in their head. Um, so there are times when it's, 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 we just provide it and let them explore it. Um, typically the time we check it the most is when we have a situation where it is important that we know certain concepts are getting across in, you know, in which case that we're doing uh, studies and things to make sure that the, the key concepts are happening. So it, it depends. It's very, it's very different. I mean, in, in many of the games, it's, it just becomes evident. Did the student beat the game? Well, you couldn't have beat the game if you didn't, uh, if you didn't master the concepts. So we don't even have to ask the question. It's just self-evident in the, uh, in the, in the game itself. Uh, yeah. That's a great thing about games, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, I agree with what Jesse's saying is it's some, every, every, you know, sort of set of learning goals is different. Every game is different. Um, you know, some of the things we've been doing in Walden are interesting, I think, because they range from, uh, you know, more of those self-evident things. Okay. I learned about self-reliance because I did all these, you know, I was able to keep myself alive versus say, you know, we have a module on social emotional learning where, I mean, it's not a checkbox, you know, this is, this is practice-based learning. It's like uh, preparing you to face difficult situations by giving you techniques, right? Techniques of identifying your emotions, of stopping, of breathing, of being, right? And, and uh, that's just, you know, when we were building that game module, which we, we've been working on um, for Walden, you know, we interviewed a lot of teachers and what they really wanted was just a, um, an experience where the students would be prompted to stop and breathe um, along with, with Thoreau and um, to have a sense of, of immersion in the world that was not task-based because it's not, you know, that's not the, 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 the experience that they need to then have those discussions in the classroom about these practices. So every, every set of learning goals is going to be very different. In some instances, we do, you know, we create curriculum that has traditional assessments and exit tickets and all the things that a teacher is going to be looking for. Um, but quite frankly, most teachers are very creative and they just make their own anyways, right? So they, they use the game and then they're like, they look at our materials and I'm like, oh, and then I, then I could do it my way. And you're like, great, great, that's awesome, right? Um, in, in many ways, the curriculum that comes 
with the game-based learning experience is a jumping off point for those creative teachers. Yeah, yeah a, a, absolutely. We, we've had a fascinating experience recently with, uh, you know, we'd had our Happy Adams product, which is a, uh, you know, uh, a, a kit for assembling molecular models and then scanning them with a computer. And we had a teacher come to us and say, wow, this is great, but I don't know if I can afford to buy these models the, for my whole class. Cause with, you know, with magnets and everything, they're a little expensive. Is it okay if I make a 2d version and try that myself? And we said, sure, go ahead. Uh, it might work. And she tried it out. She's like, this kind of works. And we stared at it and said, Oh, this is really interesting that this works. And uh, what if we did this right? And so we, we kind of took where, where, which she'd started with and we're turning it into like a 2D version of the product, which is much more affordable. And so I, I love that we're able to kind of have this dialogue with teachers where they're kind of say, well, it would be helpful if you took it here. And we're like, oh yeah, I, we, we can do that. And so that, that's one of the wonderful things about this kind of medium. Yeah, teachers are very good at um, iterating and, and yeah. making things work for them, right? Because we have as many different time frames and, and students and classes. And I've got science classes that I've seen that have four students in it and they make that work. And then they, you know, um, anyway. So here's my next question. So Jesse, uh, we know that Shell Games has won several SBIR awards um, at, from the US Department of Education and Tracy, your, your work has been awarded some NEH and NEA uh, dollars to support this work. So can you talk about the unique opportunities provided by these types of funding so that you can do cutting edge R&D? Oh yeah, I know the, the, these grants are, are really incredibly helpful because they can be the difference between, hey, there's kind of a cutting edge project that we'd like to do, but ooh, it's a, maybe a little too risky um, and when the, when you, the grant comes in, you're like, all right, we are ready to do the experiment and to kind of be a little bolder and get out there and see if this works. So sometimes it's the difference between a, pro a product existing or not existing. And then other times it's the difference between, well, we were planning to do it, but we were going to do it in the kind of this small way that doesn't have all the features we want. And then getting the grant can be like, nope, now we can actually put in what we know the teachers need, what we know the students need. And so it, 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 again, so it's, it's, it's funny because sometimes the grant helps you take a risk that you'd be afraid to take. And other times the grant takes the risk away because your risk might have been, we're going to put this out here, but it's so small that it may not work. And now the grant is going to like, now we know we can make it work. So there's, there's, a, there's a number of different ways these can be really helpful towards, towards getting the right products out. Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, I just want to say that the evolution of the funding opportunities to include games has been, that's one of the big changes that has happened over the past 10 years, I would, in, in my opinion, right? So, um, yeah. you know, I was talking about the way back when of it, right? When people were writing articles about, oh, you can't have these subject matter scout covered in a game. But, you know, the real transition was when there were opportunities for support. And, and I've told this story many times in other places but you know like Walden was a personal project that we worked on and with a very tiny team volunteers for like five years and you know as Jesse mentioned you know we we probably would have sort of gone on and and completed that in a in a, a much smaller way in a, in a much less polished way and um you know that would have been a thing a personal game a little thing that we did right and and yeah being able to get the kind of funding that we did um, and polish it and really, you know, make it rich the way that we really wanted to um, was only possible because of, of the funding that we received. And so, um, you know, I think when you talk about games for impact, um, a lot of times uh, we don't realize that the impact part is a, a, a not just the topics, it's not just the content, right? It's like, it's actually getting it out there, making it compete with, uh, you know, other other games in the market, make it, making it, uh, when the kids, the kids, they see it, they're like, oh, this feels like a game, this feels real, right? Um, mm -hmm. This doesn't feel like a piece of educational software, right? Um, right. And, and that takes support. That takes that takes um, support and and so you know honestly that's one of the biggest changes I've seen and I certainly hope that for the future 
um, we see even more opportunities and especially support, ongoing support for, um, for games so that they can, um, you know, go on from the launch period. And that's something we don't think about a lot, but it's like, what happens when a game launches? Well, in this today's world, a piece of software just doesn't end. Right. Uh, you know, software as a service organist is a service, uh, you know, uh, industry really these days. And so, you know, having specific grants for making sure that games go on as the, you know, even as after they first get into classrooms, I think is a whole subset of grants. I hope we see. Yeah. I mean, it's making, making educational software nowadays, it's, it's less like publishing a book and it's more like opening a museum. And so you need to figure out how am I going to keep this thing going? Okay. So I've been told I have a few minutes. So I have two really important questions. And one of them is near and dear to my heart. I listened to you both. And I'm so happy to hear you talk about you reaching out to teachers, right? And my question is just, do you get opportunities to reach out to students and, and get their feedback on? Because students, what I loved about teaching middle school is you just have to ask, they'll tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the great things is, especially through the teachers um, uh, and through COVID, which has been a really great opportunity for us, we go into classrooms, right, in COVID and, and talk to the students about their experiences. And, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great little trade-off because they, we learn about how they learned with our game, but then we can teach them a little bit about game design and the process. Um, and it's, it's, it's been really, really rewarding. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's essential because when you, when you build educational games, you, they must meet the needs of the teacher and the needs of the student. And so you need to intimately know both of those because they're not the same. Uh, and so you need to understand both and find something that is going to give them both what they need. Right. Well, so that makes my heart happy. Thank you. Because I'm always thinking, you know, we're all here to serve kids. That's what we do. Uh, so my last question, and I'm, I hope this isn't too overarching but what do you think there is a game a game that you've played that you think has stood the test of time besides the ones you created which by the way i <laughs> love them well i'll jump in because i i was just playing uh today the newest version of the organ trail um and you know they've updated it right um and i think they've done it in a really sensitive way um so you know here's a game that's really one of the earliest successful uh, yeah. learning games ever, but it had some, you know, deep cultural issues, right? And um, rather than sort of denying that, I think it's really great to see those developers say, okay, let's, let's actually restructure this and think about, you know, the fact that, you know, what we thought of as, you know, sort of pioneers going out and, and expanding for a very long time. And now we recognize that for the indigenous peoples, uh, it was an invasion, right? And that needs to be dealt with. And you can still have your fun game, but understanding those characters, understanding those themes, that's got to be a part of the discussion. And they did it in a really, really great way, I thought. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree that Oregon Trail has absolutely withstood the test of time. I'd also put out uh, Carmen San Diego as a game structure that like it, it it continues to be meaningful uh and and relevant by you know just the, the the concept of making the entire world your game board and that in order to succeed you've got to go and find that information yourself the game's not pushing the information on you it's kind of just creating a situation where you can play this game if you know about what's going on with geography and that model of, of kind of getting the players to, to go and learn about it on their own, in their own way, originally, you know, with an actual almanac, uh, but nowadays doing it with the internet so that you can kind of learn about geography, like that, that it really holds up. Oh, Tammy, you're muted. Tammy, we lost you. Oh, sorry, I do that. Um, so I just want to thank you, you guys, for joining us today at the Wilson Center. And I just want to tell you, I appreciate all you do for kids because I, Jesse, to you, I want to say that I am two classes short of a chemistry minor. And if I had had Happy Adams, maybe I would have understood it. But I just, when you can't see something and you just are struggling with that, right? So thank you for that. 
And of course, Tracy, thank you. Thank you for Walden and all your work. Like Henry David Thoreau is my all time favorite philosopher since I was like 13. And so to see that game, and of course I love nature, but that it was so well done, so well done. So I just wanna thank you for your contributions uh, to game-based learning. It, it, you guys are just phenomenal. Um, so we hope you can join us for more of the Ed Games Expo and thanks for being here with us today. All right, thanks so much, Tammy. Yes, Thank thanks you. for having us.